thank you, thank you, and welcome to the show. Let me tell you a story. It was, that was happening in the Midwest US. And do you know, when you are entering a farm, the people, they give you coveralls. And at that time, they were giving me a red coral, and it was quite a funny thing, because the people, they were looking around and making a kind of, wow, do you know that guy has the red? While other people, they were having normal coveralls, think that it was the blue one. Well, I was entering the farm, walking through the farm, and all of a sudden, when I just was going in the middle of the barn, a boar was jamming to me, just trying to eat me, and I was, oh, what happened here? <laughs> you know, everybody was laughing at me. I say, why they are attacking me because I have this red coverall? I say, of course, because we are using the red coverall, do you know for what? For giving injections to the animals. Wow. So the pigs are afraid of injections. So this is why they are reacting like this. So this is why to have needle-free injection is something that avoids this kind of thing. But it's not only about needle-free, it's about also how, in which way, this needle-free, they give good immunization. So let's talk about immunization and welcome to the show tonight! Thank you, thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much, guys. Immunology. If we talk about immunology, it's not an easy thing to talk about. So you need to find someone that they can do it in the best way and that knows a lot. And for sure that this person is someone coming from Universidad do Paso Fundo in Brazil. Please, a warm welcome to Professor Rafael Brandoloso. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Hey, how are you? I'm very good. Have you, you seen the pig around? Yes, I saw and I take some energy from him. Okay, do you know it's healthy? Yeah, super healthy. Okay, let's talk about immunology for a while. Yes, thank Please you. Please have a seat. Hey, Mikel, I'm very excited to be here with you. Really? Yes, yes I, I'm super excited. I, I haven't been... Please feel comfortable. You are at home, so... Ah, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Enjoy it. <laughs> so, do, do you have this kind of nerd persons that when you are in a party, uh, you are surrounded, you have a circle of people and you are in the middle just talking about immunology? Uh, yes, sometime, but it's it's depend uh, on, on what or what depend on um, who uh, the invitations came from. For example, if the invitation comes from my wife, I can't talk about immunology at all. But if the invitation came from uh, um, a work colleague, uh, they invited me normally to talk about immunology and discuss some projects. So, yes, depends. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what will be the wall without, without vaccine, especially the animal, the animal health wall? What will be today? Would be impossible. Uh, it would be possible for pigs, would be possible for companion animals. So, if we, we're thinking about pigs in, in, the, in, the, in the current um, characteristic of our system, very productive, very... Uh, with a, a high density of animals with different uh, diseases entering the farm. So it's impossible to reason animals uh, like pigs without vaccines. So we need to use the vaccine to prevent clinical outbreak, but not just clinical outbreak. We need to use to control infection and reduce horizontal uh, transmission of pathogens. So also, um, the vaccination is a very good strategy to control the antibiotic usation. So we, we only will achieve the reduction of antibiotic use uh, if we, we prevent the occurrence of diseases. And there is no best way to do that um, uh, without vaccines. Do you know that there is a technique that it's called Inovo vaccination? No? So, uh, and it looks like that we are vaccinating the animals earlier and earlier and earlier in the day life. No? So now we are even having vaccination at one day of life. Can you talk a little bit about that? I know that it's a topic that maybe it's not an easy one to cover because it could be really very broad, but... This is a very uh, good question and we, we, we received this question many, many times in the field. Um, and it's not very easy to answer this question, but we have some scientific foundation to, to address this question. So, uh, Mikael, for example, the, the, the immune system at the 
neonato uh, stage is not uh, full uh, developed. So this maturity is a progressive process and it's important to mature the immune system, the contact with a different microorganism that came from the south, goats, or simple the environment. So these microorganisms will produce some molecules that help the development, the activation and development of the adaptive immune system. So um, if you apply a vaccine in a piglet with a one day old, uh, for sure, you will not develop uh, a very good immune response. It's, it's, it's impossible to do that. That's really interesting. I want to know a little bit about your thoughts on what is um, ID vaccination, intradermal vaccination. Yes. Uh, as you know, most of vaccine is designed to apply intramuscularly. And, and we need to generate uh, an inflammatory uh, process to be possible secretion of molecules that will be the attraction, chemiotraction of many cells to capture the antigen, mm -hmm. start the processing, etc. So in the dermis, uh, in, in all dermis, it doesn't matter if it's the neck, shoulder, back, it doesn't matter. All is the same. All is the same. So in the, in the out layer, we'll see the epidermis and just below, we'll find the dermis. And the dermis always that is the same composition of resident cells. That's mast cell, macrophage, and dendritic cells. And we have a bench of dendritic cells. It, it because, uh, so why? Even we, more than the ones that we found when we are given an intramuscular one? Oh, for sure. So much more, much more. Because if you're thinking about protection, the resident cells is located there to capture fast as possible an invasor. So, and the skin is, is, is huge. So this is a protection mechanism. So when you deliver the antigen in the dermis, the dendritic cells is there. So we'll capture the antigen very fast, start the processing, antigen processing to uh, in the further step to presenting associated to the MHC class one or class two. And this is important. No, no, go ahead. Yes, this is important. Why is important? Because in the dermis, we will find a very specific subpopulation of dendritic cells that can do the cross antigen presentation. So in the muscle, we'll see conventional dendritic cells that most likely present the antigen uh, using MHC class two molecules that will generate a T helper immune response inside of the lymph node. But in the dermis, this a specific subset of dendritic cells can do also the presentation uh, by a MHC class one molecule that inside of the lymph node will generate a cytotoxic T cell response. That is amazing. Even if you use, for example, that virus in the muscle, will generate just uh, a humoral immune response, antibody production. But if you go to the dermis, we can also generate a T cell response. So can we, can we then generate mucosal immunity through ID vaccination? Yes. How is that possible then? No, we, we can think or... Yes, yes, it's possible. And, and we published this um, a couple of years ago. Um, we we, we uh, developed a, a, basic, uh, a particle based vaccine using a transfer binder receptor. Uh, and one group was immunized uh, by dermis, and we assessed the mucosal immunity associated to the upper respiratory tract, and we saw there the antibody against the target. So also in that experiment, something very new, uh, Mikael, uh, we applied the vaccine uh, just inside of the mouth uh, in the subepithelial layer, so with a, a needle-free device. So, and we generated mucosal immunity, even when we combined intradermal plus intraoral vaccination, but directly on the mucosal. It's something that we are exploiting for human immunization. The needle-free is something that we need to take into consideration uh, in our routine. So an ID vaccination may work against Lausonia, for sure. For sure. 
works. No and doubt. No doubts, because okay. we have data about that as well. Do you like coffee? I like too much coffee. So then, as a Brazilian, for sure, I understand. So please accept from us this, this little present that it's oh our, our mug from our show. So thank you very much. Oh, I, for I sure, I will use it a lot. Okay. I hope that you enjoy the show as we enjoy uh, listening to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. So guys, this is it. So uh, please give a applause to say goodbye to Professor <laughs> Rafael Frangoloso. Thank you very much. In this week's Breaking Swine News, the latest benchmark data. Let's connect again with our man in Iowa, Dero Hocam. Hello, Dero. Hi, Miguel. Hello, welcome back. Uh, do you have more relevant data on the latest published edition of the Global Swine Benchmarking? Sure do. Do you know which countries ranked at the top uh, on animal husbandry and productivity? <laughs> the ones at the peaks, they get spa treatments, do yoga, and have personal trainers. Not really. Uh, but it turns out that Denmark and the Netherlands and the Czech Republic were the top performers in animal husbandry and productivity. This gave producers in those countries a competitive advantage of 32 and 27 U.S. cents per kilogram carcass weight uh, compared to a country with average productivity. So, no bad. More piglets per sow per year always means that you are being more productivity. So, it means that you are doing the things right. Absolutely, Miguel. Uh, these data evaluate the importance of genetics and health, nutrition, uh, and animal husbandry in all stages of production. Daryl, how all these data actually turn into profits? Because, let's be honest here. Uh, the real million dollar question is in which countries are the ones that they are making the most bacon for raising pigs? Great question, Miguel. Uh, I've got to admit, uh, if we judge pork producers the same way we evaluate companies based on profitability, uh, 2022 would have been a rough year as many of the countries had negative profits. What, 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 what? This is a real donor deal. No doubt about it. Uh, 2022 was a rough ride, uh, mostly because of skyrocketing feed costs. Uh, but there were a few bright spots. The U.S., South Korea, and China managed to stay ahead with a profit advantage of 48, 40, and 34 U.S. cents per kilogram, a carcass weight, respectively, uh, over the world average. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Daryl. It's been also a nice journey, the ones that you give us, telling all this information about the swine benchmarking. Thank you, Daryl, <laughs> for all these insights. And with that, we wrap the, this edition of Breaking Swine News. Thank you for turning it and see you next time. <laughs> well, this is the end, guys. We'll learn a little bit more about immunology with Professor Frandoloso. I think that it's been a great thing. And of course, we were jumping into what it was, the swine benchmark. And maybe more to come in next show. Until next time, remember, show must go on. Good night, everyone.